from the studios of Farm Journal Broadcast. This is Ag Day. Farmers in Ukraine forced to suit up. When the farmer goes into the field wearing this bulletproof vest and the helmet in the tractor, knowing that there might be a mine, but he's still going and planting. The desperate need to move grain out of the area. Millions of people around the world starving to death. And we need these ports open and we need it now. The White House works to try and help the situation abroad and here at home. And our farmers are helping both on both fronts, reducing the food cost of price of food at home and expanding production and feeding the world in need. How the president wants to fight food inflation right now on Ag Day. Good morning, I'm Clinton Griffiths. It's something impacting every American, whether they're a farmer or a consumer. Inflation and new numbers show it remains extremely high. April's Consumer Price Index is still near historic highs at 8.3%, but it was slightly lower than in March. The Labor Department says on a month-to-month -month basis, prices rose three-tenths of a percent from March to April, the smallest increase in eight months. Now, experts say prices will likely remain high over the summer, but they say this new data suggests the inflation peak in terms of a percentage increase could be behind us. But for now, higher food and energy costs remain, and the White House is blaming the war in Ukraine for adding fuel to the inflation fire. President Biden on Wednesday traveling to an Illinois farm, announcing new actions aimed at boosting food production to feed people around the world along with lowering food prices. Now the president, joined by Ag Secretary Tom Vilsack, visited O'Connor Family Farm in Kankakee, announcing a plan to increase production by increasing the number of counties eligible for double cropping insurance. The White House saying it would add as many as 681 additional counties. It would also cut costs for farmers by increasing technical assistance for technology-driven precision agriculture and other nutrient management tools. As for lowering historically high fertilizer prices, the administration wants to double the funding for domestic fertilizer production from $250 million to $500 million. Farmers worried about raising, for, ri, rising fertilizer uh, costs and what is the content of the fertilizer. That's why earlier this year, the U.S. Department of Agriculture announced it would invest $250 million to boost fertilizer production. Literally on the plane out here on Air Force One, I turned to Tom and I said, Tom, double that. Make it $500 million. It's so desperately needed. We can't take chances. It's critical to get this done. But getting those extra planted acres may be tough right now, with planning progress still running behind. The latest crop progress report from USDA says only 22% of the nation's corn crop is planted. It's the slowest start in nine years and is 28 points behind the five-year average. At last report, Illinois farmers trailed the average corn planting pace by 43 points at just 15% planted. Indiana stands at 11% and Iowa at 14. And in states such as Minnesota, North and South Dakota, the story is much the same. May 25th is the deadline for planting corn in most of North Dakota. You have a lot more profitability on the table for corn, and I, I feel like guys are really going to need to take that profitability uh, with the unknowns coming forward for input. So hopefully we can get some in, but realistically, you're looking at very limited ability if this storm system comes here uh, tonight, Wednesday night into Thursday and puts another system through uh, late Sunday, Tuesday, which they're doing next week that would probably be the dagger that you're just not going to see really any corn planted. But the heat is on this week and market watchers think major planning progress could be made in the coming days in other states that are running behind. And North Dakota certainly doesn't need more moisture right now. The latest crop progress report saying just 1% of the corn crop has been planted there. Meteorologist Matt Yurisavik joins us and Matt, whether they like it or not, severe weather is on the way. Yeah, Clinton, that's right. We've got more severe weather on the way. I know it's been a wild ride in the Dakotas over the last uh, month or so. 
but we're at it again with that severe weather threat as we head through today, especially for the eastern Dakotas, parts of the upper Midwest as well. This area highlighted here in red. That is your severe weather threat as we head through today, but it also extends farther to the south down into parts of Texas, into parts of Kansas and even Oklahoma as well, right along a cold front and a dry line all the way down there into the south. Today, though, the tornado threat, it maximized right here inside of that highlighted area. Parts of uh, Minnesota up into uh, south eastern portions of North Dakota and eastern portions there of South Dakota as well. So here's a look at that system as it gets rolling. You can see we've outlined that severe weather threat and as this storm system moves into the afternoon, six, seven, eight o'clock, here comes those storms firing right along that cold front and continuing to move to the north and east. Again, that tornado threat is very real along with the threat for some large hail in some of those areas. And then as that slowly starts to move eastward, that severe weather threat on Friday will move over into portions of Wisconsin, Iowa, and even Illinois, right along that cold front and also stretching down into parts of Texas as well. We'll have more on that forecast coming up here in just a little bit. All right, thanks, Matt. After hearing the latest announcement from the White House about plans to increase production, you may be wondering what happened to that $500 million ag-related proposal it announced earlier this month. Well, it was part of the latest Ukrainian aid package, but no more, as House Democrats have tossed it out. The Farm Journal Washington analyst Jim Wiesmeyer reporting there was very little support for it. Now, you'll remember the package included an increased number of loans and crop insurance incentives in order to grow more wheat and soybeans, but some global food aid didn't make it. President Biden's proposed $20 million in funding for the Bill Emerson Humanitarian Trust did get passed in the final bill. It now goes to the Senate. The president earlier this week said Ukraine has 20 million metric tons of wheat and corn in storage that the U.S. and its allies are trying to help get shipped out of the country to feed people around the world. But key shipping areas in Ukraine, such as the city of Odessa on the Black Sea, are getting hammered right now by Russian forces. Farmers in the area are planting corn and wheat for the June harvest, but with silos already full from the previous harvest and ports closed, there is nowhere for it to go. This grain helps feed 400 million people around the world, and these ports are shut down because of this war. We need to get the ports open, operational. Otherwise, we're going to have catastrophe on top of catastrophe, millions of people around the world starving to death. And we need these ports open, and we need it now. Before the war, 98% of grain exports from Ukraine were transported via the Black Sea. Ukraine's president has said that shortages of grain exports were bound to get worse if attacks continued and Western powers did not put an end to the Russian blockade of Ukrainian ports. When farmers or ranchers in the U.S. face tragedy, others in the industry are quick to help. Now that mentality of farmers helping farmers is also happening in Ukraine as support rolls in from across the globe. The images of destruction and devastation litter the Ukrainian countryside. Farms turn to battlegrounds as Russia's invasion of Ukraine stretches into another month. I was supposed to be flying out from Kyiv Borispil Airport on the night of the attack at 9 a.m. with the group of Ukrainian farmers to Costa Rica. Roman had a career giving agricultural tours in Ukraine and around the world. That changed in an instant. After getting family, including his own children, to safety, he's now in the U.S., focused on raising awareness and support for his farmer friends back home. My first ever farmer who traveled with me, he is in Kherson Oblast, and I knew that he was captured by Russian military about a week ago, and I didn't hear anything from him. So he answered to me, Roman, I cannot talk long, you understand why, I am safe, we are trying to work. But work has been difficult in places. He says agriculture infrastructure, equipment, and even fields have been targeted. Territories that were under occupation but got freed up, they have a huge risk of their mines. Landmines and munitions are everywhere. When the farmer goes into the field wearing this bulletproof vest and the helmet in the tractor, knowing that there might be a mine, but he's still going and planting. Why? Because he knows that he needs to give, to pay to land plot holders to pay this money for the rental of the land because they will also depend upon him. Global Agricultural Bin and Infrastructure Company, AGI, has employees in that region. 
they came to us and they said, hey, we've got an idea. With some of our customers and our employees, we can provide a last mile logistics, but we can't really buy medical goods. Can you guys at head office help us with that? They agreed and have since been raising money and sending medical supplies to those in need. You know, your fields are flooded and you're about to lose your barn or your house, you know, somebody comes and helps. It's just, there's no fuss about that. It's, and it's very true to what's happening on this project. While the fighting may be isolated, the impacts are global. But the next phase of this problem in Ukraine, if you ask me, affects the whole world because we see farmers, some of our commercial customers, their silos are being bombed. Like there is wheat spilled everywhere. There, it's, the, whole foods, the whole food supply chain is being destroyed. Ukraine may be a major exporter. However, its future rests in the hands of those still at home. About 56% of Ukrainian uh, population, they have farmlands from one hectare to more. The many small holder farms remain a vital part of the ag industry. For instance, the farms ranging from two to 500 acres. They supply the total volume of production, at least 30% of the crops and uh, field commodities and up to half of all the products made of animals. Here, small farmers grow 90% of potatoes, 60% of milk, and nearly half of the small grains. Roman says they will be the ones that provide food when villagers return to rebuild. It's also why he's raising money in awareness. They are actually the second field, battlefield, field, the farmers. So the first are the military, and these people, they are the second. They will be the ones to whom we will come next month and ask, give us something to eat. Food essential to sustaining life and ultimately the key to rebuilding its future. To learn more about what these organizations are doing, go online to the addresses on your screen. They are World to Rebuild Rule Ukraine and AGI's Step Up for Ukraine. We'll have those links on our website at agweb.com. The USDA has a big report due out later today. We'll discuss what to watch coming up next. And later, a family of hawks makes their home in an unusual place. Find farm equipment on Machinery Pete's May 17th online auction. No reserve, no buyer fees. Start bidding now at auctions.machinerypete.com. Joe Vaklovic with Standard Grain. Joe, as we talk about what's been going on with planning, obviously we've finally seen some warm weather this week. A lot of folks out in the field what do you think the chances are of us catching up with the uh, kind of average pace here? I don't think we're going to catch up to the average pace anytime soon, but I do believe that planting has been fairly active and ongoing in a lot of areas this week. Um, there are problem areas, definitely. Um, the north, north part, northwest part of the Corn Belt is problematic. Uh, southern Minnesota, North Dakota, maybe parts of South Dakota. There is some widespread chatter regarding um, either switching out of corn into another crop or maybe even prevent plant. You're only a couple weeks away from your final corn planting date in uh, North Dakota when it comes to crop insurance and a little bit more than that in Minnesota. So there's that sort of, of chatter floating around. And I don't know if that's realized or not. I have my doubts about whether or not USDA's March intentions were accurate to begin with. But uh, that sort of chatter in itself is friendly because, you know, as most people see it, and we haven't seen USDA's report yet, but as most people see it, the, this new crop corn balance sheet cannot tolerate lower acres or any sort of big yield problem. It's just, it's really tight. So it's an interesting situation, definitely. Well, and you, you mentioned that you can't really tolerate, you know, a, a tighter balance sheet, but it, you know, we're so far behind now, it feels like that's what we should start to expect here. Yeah, and I think the market is reflecting that to some extent. You know, we had a sell-off in the corn market to start off this week, and I think some of that had to do with pressure in the outside markets. I think some of it had to do with a better-looking uh, planting window. But yeah, there's going to be questions about the crop. I mean, from now through harvest, people are going to question how big is the crop? Was it a trend yield? Were the acres there? Uh, the issue with acres is that we don't get our next update from USDA until the end of June uh, in that planted acreage report. So we're kind of left in the dark uh, in regard to that situation uh, for another, what, another six weeks now. 
Yeah, there'll be plenty of time for people to speculate yep. and try to figure out exactly how many acres went in. Joe, sure appreciate it. Thank you for being here. Yep. We'll be back with more Ag Day coming up in just a minute. For more information about Standard Grain and its services, call Joe at 312-462-4438. And as we're heading through today, we are going to be watching that severe weather risk. We highlighted it a little bit earlier, but here it is again. The best chance for severe storms in this red shaded area all the way down portions of Nebraska up into northwestern Iowa, east western portions of Minnesota, eastern North Dakota, right along uh, some of those major highways there and then up towards the Grand Forks and Fargo area there in North Dakota, dealing with uh, potential for some larger hail, some tornadoes as well, and those strong gusty winds and heavy rain also a threat in this area. That though, not the only area all the way down the cold front and then the dry line into Texas portions uh, of Texas, Oklahoma, and even Kansas south of that main threat going to have the chance for a few stronger storms later today. Then as we head into Friday, that risk moves eastward up into portions of Wisconsin, Illinois, Iowa, down to Missouri, and continuing right on through Texas and Oklahoma as that cold front continues to move eastward very slowly, but bringing that chance of storms along with it. So here is that system heading into the Dakotas as we head through the morning and into the afternoon. And once this starts wrapping up, you can see there's the cold front going to be uh, kind of firing those storms to the north and then the dry line down to the south that whole system moving eastward and you can see those storms popping up and then as we head into Friday here comes more storms is eventually popping up there along that cold front into Friday evening in parts of the upper Midwest but also down into parts of Texas and Oklahoma Meanwhile, the system still off the east coast spinning here bringing clouds and some showers a couple thunderstorms to the east coast and a couple more rain showers and some higher elevation snow moving into the west. And you can see the precipitation, most of it going on here in the northern plains. Again, halting some of that planting up there, but more scattered activity as we head towards the weekend. That will begin to move east along with that cold front. And here's a look at those temperatures. We're going to be in the 80s and 90s out ahead of this front. Very hot, very humid, and that's going to continue into the morning with lows only into the 60s. And again, highs back into the 80s and 90s for a good portion of the Midwest down into the Central Plains as we head through tomorrow afternoon. Eventually, this ridge breaks down and a cooler pattern sets in, but that's not until after the weekend and as we head into next week. And we'll keep tracking that right here on Ag Day. That's a look around the country. Now let's take a look at the weather where you live. Sioux Falls, South Dakota, mostly sunny with afternoon severe thunderstorms, likely a high of 92 degrees. Sunny, hot and humid in Texarkana, Texas, 93 degrees that high. And Roseburg, Oregon, showers likely a high of 55. It's time to sign up for the 2022 United Pork Americas Conference in Orlando, Florida. Register today at UnitedPorkAmericas.com and join us September 7th through the 9th. Drover's report on Ag Day is brought to you by Long Range Epidemectin. If you're committed to peak performance, there's only one choice for your dewormer, Long Range Epidemectin. It's the first and only dewormer to offer up to 150 days of parasite control in one convenient dose. While drought is forcing some early herd liquidation and cow culling, beef imports to the U.S. are up sharply. According to Oklahoma State's Darrell Peel, beef imports in the first quarter of this year are up 41% year over year. The biggest increase in shipments coming from Brazil as the country now has access to send fresh product to the U.S. Now for multiple years it was limited to just cooked product due to disease concerns. Uh, so we do expect it to be higher. However, I doubt that it will stay as high as it has been so far this year. Um, Brazil was uh, temporarily locked out of China late last year. Uh, so I suspect that they've got kind of uh, some supplies, if you will, of product that uh, was looking for a home. Uh, plus, you know, in the early part of the year, uh, there was open, uh, uh, in terms of the tariff rate quota, there was an open, open market. Uh, Brazil has filled that, and so uh, there'll be sharply higher tariff rates on, on imports coming in for the rest of the year. On the export side, Peel says U.S. beef exports are running about 6% ahead of last year's record pace with Japan, South Korea, and China leading the demand. Construction delays are nothing new, but the hold up in using this Iowa crane may be a first. That story next.
if you've been through Iowa, you know how important Hawkeye football is to the state and protecting the symbol of its football team has taken on new meaning after a family of Hawks set up a nest on a construction crane and it's right outside of a hospital near the University of Iowa. Now the nest was discovered in early March and just last week two of the three eggs hatched. Since wild birds like these are federally protected, advocacy groups are calling for use of the crane to be suspended until all eggs are hatched and the family flies the coop and that could take another five to six weeks. And there you have it. That's all of our time this morning. We're sure glad you tuned in. From all of us here at Agnes, I'm Clinton Griffiths. Have a great day. Have a fun day.